All right, everybody, thank you and welcome to Wonderful Wednesdays. And today we're going to talk about afterload, actually, sort of like love, actually, but it's afterload, actually. And afterload, actually, is really about trying to understand kind of resistance and the effects that vasopressors can have on ventricular function. So whenever we think about our afterload and we talk about our afterload, really, really important, very important for us to remember and to discuss. Adrienne's here, so she's going to take over with the PA catheter. We just finished talking about PA catheter. And I'm going to go out in the hallway, my friends. So hopefully we're all still on. I think we are. Okay. So when we talk about afterload, actually, what we're really remembering and thinking about and understanding as we're evaluating our patients is what kinds of things offer resistance to the way in which we are evaluating our patients. So uh, Renee or uh, Eugenia, can you just come on and tell me whether or not you see the slides? You might not be seeing the slides, but we may. Yes, not. I, I can see them. They're they're um, not in presentation mode, but I can see it. Okay. There Better? you go. Yeah. Yes. That is in presentation mode, but it was the presentation mode when you're connected to a screen, which I was connected to. Okay. So afterload, really important, just is about the force that your ventricle must generate to overcome resistance. And that resistance is at the valve and in the artery. And the afterload of that muscle that muscle, when the afterload increases, you're gonna need more oxygen, you're gonna need more blood flow delivery, and you are more at risk for myocardial ischemia. So that is a really important concept. And there's no number that we can really use, no calculation that we can really use. What we always wanna look at is the relationship of vasoconstriction to stroke volume. That's gonna give us the very best way of understanding afterload. As I titrate up on my vasopressors in the pursuit of making the blood pressure higher, what I actually want to evaluate is what that does to my LV stroke volume. Now, best way to measure LV stroke, stroke volume is with a LV measurement device, like an echocardiogram, like Starling, like uh, FlowTrack. Those things can help us look at LV ejection. PA catheter is not the LV, it's the RV. So we're really going to think about methodologies. We don't have any of those but we have an A-line, then we're gonna look at pulse pressure. If I'm vasoconstricting and my pulse pressure narrows, if I'm vasoconstricting and my stroke volume reduces, I have not improved the state of my patient. So we really wanna take a look at that afterload actually, and just remind ourselves that as afterload goes up, as resistance to ventricular ejection goes up, stroke volume will go down. As stroke volume goes down, that means that your uh, end systolic volume will go up, your end diastolic volume will go up, but the amount of volume that you eject from the heart will go down. So that's a really important concept because so much of what we do in critical care is about pursuit of arterial pressure, but we're not always looking at the effect of that on our ventricular ejection. When we look at a basic Frank Starling curve, that's stroke volume here, left ventricular and diastolic pressure here, that would be your wedge pressure. You could even use your CVP. It is really important to remember that what actually happens when your afterload goes up is that your stroke volume goes down. So you can see that here. Stroke volume goes down when the afterload goes up. So as I increase your arterial resistance, your stroke volume will go down. Now, I can't know that by some simple calculation. What I have to do is think about a Frank Starling curve, and I could just use CVP here and stroke volume, CVP and stroke volume. And what I see is as I vasoconstrict and venoconstrict, my CVP will go up. But if my CVP goes up and my stroke volume does not, that's called a shift to the right in the Frank Starling curve. And that should clearly be a sign to me that I am not moving in the right direction that what I actually really have to consider and think about doing is increasing ventricular ejection and improving my stroke volume by actually reducing my uh, vasopressors by increasing inotropic support. So really important to remember, afterload is inversely related to stroke volume. When afterload goes up, stroke volume goes down, and the opposite is true. Now it often will take a very brave person indeed to say, 
yeah, your pressure is normal. And I think I might need to vasodilate in order to increase the stroke volume because we're so nervous about blood pressure, rightfully so, that we don't often want to dilate patients. But sometimes patients just need pure inotrope or they might need inodilation to actually improve their stroke volume. Okay, so just really think about all the kinds of things that you listen to, you talk about, you read about, that we, we want to remind ourselves that we do calculations, those are called TPR or SVR calculations, that are basic indicators of our afterload that give us some ideas about what's occurring, um, that tell us about the amount of resistance offered to the ventricle and the amount of tension that the ventricle must generate in order to overcome that resistance. So in general, in general, what we're gonna say is that again, as SVR goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your afterload goes up, all of which you're pretty happy about. Oh, the blood pressure has gone up. Their patients got better blood flow, things are better. But actually their cardiac output and most importantly, their stroke volume goes down. So one of the things that we have to think about when we're managing critically ill patients is we have to think about the risk benefit ratio of vasoconstriction and correlate that vasoconstriction to the effect that it has on ventricular performance. You can't do that if you're not monitoring ventricular performance. And that's going to be really, really, really important for us to do. Monitor ventricular performance. And ventricular performance can be monitored with an echocardiogram, with a starling, with a flow track not with a PA catheter really, because that's not left ventricular measurement. That's a right heart catheter measurement. Okay, so we really want to think about that. So when, when we talk about afterload, we think about the things that we can use to tell us about resistance to ventricular ejection. So we can look at what the patient's MAP is, what their systemic systolic pressure is. If we could look at AO pressure or AO flow, we can do that with a starling. And we calculate SVR. And SVR looks at the beginning of the circuit to the end of the circuit divided by the blood flow. So MAP minus CVP divided by cardiac output and a conversion into dyne spun multiplying times 80. If I'm measuring afterload to the right heart, I'm going to look at the mean PA, the pulmonary systolic pressure, and a calculated PVR, which is PAD minus wedge divided by cardiac output times 80. Normal SVR is 800 to 1200. Normal PVR is less than 250. And that's because, of course, the arterial veno systemic bed is highly resistant, and the pulmonary arterial venous bed has very low resistance. So the amount of tension, of course, the amount of tension that the LV has to develop just in general to eject blood into the systemic arterial veno system is much more work and much more tension. It's a higher pressure development, it's a higher resistance. The right ventricle strategically and normally has to generate a much lower pressure against much lower resistance. And that's why the RV is very underdeveloped in terms of muscular tone versus the LV, which is very overdeveloped in terms of muscular tone. Now, what happens when you increase afterload, and that would be afterload to the pulmonary vault or to the systemic vault, is that you're going to have some significant impact on ventricular ejection. So your ventricle won't empty. It won't empty as effectively. It can't get all that volume out, can't generate the amount of tension required. So there's a reduction in ventricular emptying. That's called the systolic dysfunction. And a systolic dysfunction will lead to diastolic dysfunction. Diastolic dysfunction is failure to fill because now either your ventricle is overfilled or you have lost ventricular compliance because you've developed so much musculature trying to eject blood flow forward into the aorta or into the pulmonary bed that now you have hypertrophied the muscle. So you have a decrease in their ventricular compliance. That's the diastolic dysfunction piece. Typically, when we see patients who have had high continuous resistance loads like pulmonary hypertension or systemic hypertension or very severe aortic stenosis or pulmonic stenosis, you will see a combination of both systolic and diastolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction is ejection, diastolic dysfunction is filling, and you see a failure of both. It makes perfect sense for us to always consider what afterload is. Uh, and what that really means. But something else that is very, very important is actually looking at your, ven your venous return and your venous return, you know, really, really, really important 
to remember that when I'm using vasopressor therapy to constrict the arteries, to drive the mean arterial pressure up, this also is going to significantly and profoundly constrict my veins. And when the veins get more constricted, more volume is going to be returned to the right heart. So venous return is greater when veins are constricted. So when I add norepinephrine, I think I'm treating the arterial bed and driving up the arterial pressure. But what I'm also going to do is I'm going to cause an increase in venous return, which actually, of course, is uh, a shift in the, vent in the ventricular volume load of the right ventricle and can be a change in ventricular compliance. So whenever you give a vasodilator, um, and even if you're giving it for the arterial side, you're gonna have some more uh, venous side dynamics, you need to always consider giving fluid. And we certainly think about this when we talk about patients with RV infarct, you never give nitroglycerin without giving a volume load first. Really, really important for us to remember when we're looking at our patients. And then the other little caveat, just as a reminder to you, that increasing your afterload, so you're increasing venal motor tone or venal uh, arterial motor tone or both, when you affect the tone of the vessels, what's gonna happen is that arterial tone is going to significantly profoundly limit LV ejection, but it's also gonna increase RV filling because of that enhanced venous return or venal motor tone. Okay, so, when we talk about afterload, afterload can occur because I've increased the pressure load to my left ventricle. That can occur with excessive vasoconstriction, which is typically what happens at our bedsides as we're titrating up on our vasopressors to try to achieve a mean arterial pressure. We put an excessive load against the ventricle. Hypertension, aortic stenosis, and excessive venal constriction. These are all pressure overload states. That means that the aorta is much narrower and the LV has to work that much harder to eject blood. When I'm talking about the afterload to the right heart, the most common issue that changes the afterload to the right heart is positive pulmonary pressures. And in particular, PEEP, which changes the dynamics of blood flow through the pulmonary vault because now that PEEP has forced uh, some constriction to the pulmonary vessels and now we've got an increased afterload. So what you typically see early on with an increase in afterload is an enhanced contractility. But ultimately, your ventricles, when they are working against a pulmonary hypertensive state or a systemic hypertensive state, your ventricles will develop concentric hypertrophy. What that means is you just made a lot of muscle that's not particularly compliant. It's not really stretchable. It's almost like scar tissue, very thick myofibrils. So what happens is now I've got a much thicker muscle wall with a much smaller chamber. It's much harder to fill. So I'm not, I, I, I really always like to remind everybody that a lot of what happens in the cardiac evaluation of patients, I'm not talking about people with big MIs, I'm talking about your sick patients that you're using vasopressors on. What you will typically see as you go up on vasopressors is the stroke volume will start to drop. As you go up on vasopressors, stroke volume starts to drop. They become hypotensive. You go up on the vasopressors more. Now their neck veins are distended, their CVP is elevated, their wedge pressure is elevated, their weight's gone up. You can't compress the neck vein. You think that they are very volume loaded, but it's really important to remember the question is always, do you have volume, yes or no? And where is it? And for these patients, they have volume, but it's in the wrong space. It's in the veins, it's in the interstitium, but it's not in the arteries. And that's a really important concept for us to remember. Now, the other kind of overload that can occur is also volume overload. Now, volume overload can occur to the heart because you've got valvular insufficiency. That occurs if it's mitral or tricuspid insufficiency. Then it's volume overload to the atria. That, of course, stimulates the release of BNP and really looks like a heart failure state. But also, if you have aortic regurgion, we see, we see a lot of patients with aortic regurgion because they have prolonged, sustained hypertension. The resistance load in the artery is so high pushes blood back through the aortic valve and the LV, and now the LV is volume overloaded. When we look at that patient with the POCUS or with an echo, uh, point of care ultrasound POCUS or an echocardiogram, we see that the chamber is enlarged. And now they have a deficient contraction, but they have a very large chamber. The chamber itself is hypervolemic, but the exotene vessel is hypovolemic. So again, you have low stroke volume, you have hypotension, you have full veins, high CVPs, high wedge, gained weight, neck veins are non-compressible, but 
they've got a big wide diameter LV or a big wide diameter RV, and the volume is not mobilizing into the arterial bed, either pulmonary arterial if it's RV failure or systemic arterial if it's LV failure. So really important to kind of think about vascular function and cardiac function. And what you look at is where is my best CVP? So here you can see at a CVP of two, my best CVP that intersects with the best cardiac function, okay? As I give patients volume, I'm gonna actually increase their CVP and I wanna be sure that their cardiac output of their stroke volume is also going up. So when I'm, I, I've just spent the whole day talking about this today, I've done eight hours on hemodynamics today to remind you that even though you are resuscitating towards blood pressure, you must always consider blood pressure and its effects on stroke volume. Because in the end, what you're really trying to optimize is cardiac function. And when we talk about the vascular function curve, we manipulate vascular function so aggressively when we're giving patients vasopressors and titrating up and down and all around or adding two or adding three that we can see really significant alterations. So we want to be sure that we understand that when we're at the bedside. And that brings us back to that very same thing we looked at before, which is the family of Starling curve. As afterload increases, your stroke volume goes down. As inotropy decreases, your stroke volume goes down at any given level of filling pressure, which would be either CVP or wedge. As afterload decreases or as inotropy increases, afterload decrease, inotropy increase, your stroke volume will go up. So one of the things that I project to you about your patient population, about critical patients is, do you stop to have a discussion when you have patients who have poor cardiac ejection, poor stroke volume, narrow pulse pressure, they're hypotensive, they're hypoperfuse. Do you stop to talk about whether or not the afterload that you have put against the LV is too high because you're on 30 of norepi and 10 of epinephrine plus you're on vasopressin? Do you talk about whether or not this patient might benefit from inotropic support? And if somebody, by golly, says, let's try an inotrope and you start on very low dose dobutamine, do you actually look at the effect of your inotropic support on your stroke volume, or are all you're worrying about is the blood pressure, okay? I'm not asking you a question. I already know the answer, and it's really just making sure that we understand that our role as critical care providers is to think outside the box. So we use vasopressors to resuscitate arterial pressure, but we're not thinking about what that does when we increase that afterload, what that does to ventricular ejection. It actually converts patients almost into a heart failure view, which means they cannot actually eject effectively because the resistance load, the tension requirement is too high. Now, I'm not saying you don't need that vasopressor. You need it to get their mean arterial pressure to a level that's acceptable. But if the stroke volume is decreased as you went up on your vasopressor, you may need to introduce inotropy into the situation. They might need some low dose inotropic support. Now, this brings us to something that I think is really important. You're never going to really ever see it unless you're in the cath lab. This is a ventricular pressure volume loop. And the reason I just want you to understand this, so here is, here is filling, okay? Your mitral of the LV, of your uh, mitral valve opens, you fill, 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 fill the LV until you've distended the LV and generated enough pressure that the mitral valve closes. So fill, 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 fill. Now the ventricle contracts against itself. That's called isovolumetric contraction. Contract, contract, contract until the pressure is high enough to overcome the aortic valve. Now the aortic valve opens and you bolus out volume until the pressure in the aorta is greater than the pressure in the ventricle and the aortic valve closes. Okay, this line right here represents stroke volume. So you can see you have a pretty good stroke volume. It's, it's about 60 cc's here. It starts at around somewhere around 20 or 30 and ends a little bit after 100, right? So it's about 60 cc stroke volume. You can actually quantify it. I'm just telling you what it looks like. As I add you onto a vasopressor, this is what happens. So now I have, and you know, it's just poor drawing on my behalf, but now I have a lot of work to do to get that aortic valve open. I have a small amount of time where I bolus and then the valve closes and look at what happened to my stroke volume. It's reduced by almost half. That's somebody on 10 or 12 or 16 of norepinephrine and four, six, eight of epinephrine. In the pursuit of blood pressure, what we have done 
is we've transitioned the heart to a failing heart mechanism. And I think it's really incredibly and profoundly important for us to be thinking about that when we're looking at our patients who are trying to make good decisions about treatment is as simple as possible, make it as simple as possible. You're not doing a ventricular pressure volume loop. You don't need that. What you need to see is that as each time you increase the vasopressor, what happens to the stroke volume? If you're going up on your vasopressor and your stroke volume is going down, you might be improving your diastolic tone of your artery and therefore your blood pressure, but you have significantly limited blood flow. And that's why we have to be very concerned about the idea, the concept of after load, not the calculation, not some document that you're writing down or some paper that you have to do for your epic performance. I want you to really think about what you're doing as you're titrating up on vasopressors. Is stroke volume diminishing? Is the base deficit getting worse? My patient is more and more acidotic and he has a poor and poor LV ejection, which I'm gonna measure again with an echocardiogram with Starling with a flow track. I don't really care what you measure or I'm just looking at basic pulse pressure. I don't care. What I care about is that you actually look at what you're influencing when you're actually giving your patients these vasopressors. So now let's put it into practice, okay? Here's my patient admitted to the ICU. Here's number one. Blood pressure 90 over 40, MAP is 64, doesn't have a CVP measurement, heart rate's 110, base deficit's negative seven. We're not measuring stroke volume or cardiac output. He's not on leave of that epinephrine. But he starts to evolve hypotension over the next hour or two hours, and his blood pressure drops to 80 over 38. MAP is 58, CVP is 12, heart rate is 118. He has a normal kind of response here. Base deficit got a little worse. It's negative nine. We start on four of Levo and two of Epi. Maybe not at the same time, but it happens over time. Okay. Number three, 84 over 40. MAP is 59. CVP is 14 because my heart rate went up. So my ventricle is less compliant. His stroke volume is 38, normal is 60 to 100. And he has a normal cardiac output or almost normal, four to eight uh, liters per minute is the normal cardiac output, but he only has a normal cardiac output because of his heart rate, because his stroke volume is terrible. Normal stroke volume, 60 to 100. Look at that stroke volume and look at his base deficit. It got worse. In spite of that, in spite of that, we go up on his norepinephrine. Number four, pressure 80 over 38, MAP is 54, CVP now 15, 12, 14, 15. Heart rate now from 110 has gone to 125. Stroke volume is 35 and cardiac output is 3.1. Base deficit is negative 15. Nobody, you don't need a magnifying glass to say, this patient is not getting better. He's getting worse. But in the pursuit of his mean arterial pressure, as I'm titrating up, I am actually injuring the ventricle. I am actually limiting ventricular ejection. So then I look at number five. That's where we end. His BP is 78 over 36. MAP is 51. CVP is now 16. Start at 12, now 16. Heart rate's 130, and that's why the CVP is high, because the faster the heart beats, the higher the CVP. His stroke volume has dropped significantly. 20 is almost non-survival. Cardiac output is 2.8, base deficit negative 16, still in pursuit of pressure. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but here, when you transition from four to eight of Levo and from two to four of Epi, here is a place we should have said, oh, look at that stroke volume. I need to get that stroke volume up. Oh, whoops, the orders are to get the MAP above 65. So let me go up and norepinephrine and epinephrine. Oh, look, my stroke volume went down. I'm not titrating up anymore until I figure out a way to give my ventricle, and in this case, the left ventricle, the support that it needs so that it can overcome the enhanced resistance. I want to make sure you remember, volume and inotrope resuscitate the heart, vasopressors, resuscitate the diastolic blood pressure of the artery and can significantly profoundly limit ventricular rejection. That doesn't mean don't use vasopressors. It doesn't mean don't think about resuscitating diastolic pressure. What it means is do it wisely. Be smart, follow what's happening and address your problems. Did you need a vasopressor? You surely did. But did you also need stroke volume support? Probably not in the face of volume, but yes, perhaps in the face of inotropic stimulation. So this is very important when we think about afterload actually 
that we understand that in the pursuit of blood pressure, which is necessary to drive amino arterial pressure that maintains blood flow, but at some point, our pursuit of blood pressure causes a destruction of ventricular ejection. And that should be your stopping point. So you should titrate upwards to get your mean pressure up as long as it does not limit your ventricular ejection. And you can only know that if you are monitoring stroke volume and or cardiac output of the left ventricle. So left-sided events measured with echocardiogram, with Starling, with flow track, with pulse tile blood flow, with pulse pressure, with your plethysmograph, all these things can give you an idea about whether or not my left ventricle is efficient or inefficient. So thank you very much for joining today for Afterload. Actually, next week on next Wednesday, we'll be doing a discussion about contractility. And the following week, we're going to apply all our hemodynamic principles to a patient in the ICU and kind of look at what's occurred for that patient. Look at his stroke volume, look at his pressure, look at his vasopressors, look at his pace deficit, and really make, uh, in retrospect, make some recommendations about what we might do differently with a higher level of understanding of what afterload, preload, and contractility actually are and how we influence them every day at the bedside. So as you know, I'm going to say goodbye for now. I'm going to stop my recording, but I will be available for um, any questions and answers separate. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining for today's wonderful Wednesday, Afterload Actually. Bye-bye for now.